This is just the gist of our model and how it works. It started with rigging and fuzzy pattern and bifurcated into KPIs, which were later superimposed to draw conclusive remarks on where are the sweet spots of the field, which wells are suitable candidate for secondary development operations, and which ones need stimulation jobs, etc. While carrying out this study, there were some benchmarks set on what exactly should be delivered, and this model comes up with those. This is just the gist of the principle how it is. It started First, with rigging and fuzzy the pattern efficiency by and bifurcating the need of KPIs, monitoring wells, which will lead eventually, and making the job autonomous and less laborious, which will save a lot of time. With a GUI in the pipeline based on this model, this can be a very user-friendly approach, which makes field analysis easy and interesting. It can be used as an add-in to various simulation softwares available. Last but not the least, this model eliminates the need of any licenses for access, which saves cost for both commercial and academia purposes. Now we can talk about the we have talked about the benefits of the model, but while carrying out these studies, I came through the following lookups for future in a direction for betterment of the model. These are cross validation of this model with other models to get better accuracy. Improving rigging model with hyperparameter optimization can yield better results. Saving more time with a GUI based on proposed model will get help in the future. Considering KPIs such as net pay thickness, drainage area, other than the production data, can also give better results. Lastly, incorporating saturation maps and pressure plots to get better results. At last, I would like to thank Team SP for giving me this opportunity and thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I'd now like to ask the judges to unmute themselves and turn on their cameras and um, I ask questions if you have any questions for. Yes, uh, may I? Okay. Yes, well, I just make him a co host. Okay, uh, okay. thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I want to ask that uh, in the flowchart that you already proposed that uh, one of the objective of this uh, methodology is to find the sweet spot, uh, as you mentioned, that uh, it might be reflected to the saturation map uh, in your way forward. But my question is uh, how actually you uh, find the sweet spot uh, because as a presentation that I haven't uh, found uh, the one that you already mentioned in the flowchart. Thank you. Uh Firstly, uh, please let me know if I'm audible clearly. Yes, you are. Yeah. yeah. So to confirm your question, sir, you wanted to ask, like I haven't discussed about identifying the sweet spots in particular uh, while I talked about it in the slides, right? So basically the thing is, it was a it is a very generalized solution where we where one of the thing is to identify the sweet spots of the field. And that is where I discuss uh, like when I say that from the petrophysical analysis or the Kriging method, when I come to a, I cannot come to a direct conclusion, even if I get uh, the result that the permeability of this zone is high and uh, something like that. So I need some production data and after merging the results from coming from both the solutions, then I got, get to know about the sweet spots. And per, uh, to be very specific, uh, to, this uh, entire presentation was based on a general solution to uh, suggest to uh, propose uh, an add-in to a various simulation softwares or uh, platforms where we can analyze mature fields in particular and then we can come to conclusions like is it uh, is this the sweet spots of the field or this is the well which requires stimulation job so i was not talking in particular about the sweet spot identification but i was talking in general the types of solution it will give and the different permutation we can get and based on those permu permutations from the kriging and the fuzzy model we can then jump onto the conclusion whether it is a sweet spot of the field or this requires improvement or something like that. Thank you very much for that. Any um, more this, questions? This, this is Ameka. Uh, Saranj, uh, thank you so much for a very beautiful uh, presentation. Uh, very um, informing here. Um, you did a really, really good work um, trying to um, I guess, create a, a high level method of uh, trying to drill down, you know, from a field that has 
uh, lots of wells to areas where you might need to um, optimize. Um, Saranj, my question um, is actually, uh, I have two questions, right? Um, the first question I have is, uh, I believe it's from page 12, uh, where you talked about, um, where you talked about the well fuzzy index. And yes. I wanted to find out, um, is your well fuzzy index a function of cumulative of your oil, water, and gas collectively, or is it uh, a combination of just one or the other? Like, is, is it a combination of the three uh, produced fluids or is it just one or the other? So that, that's my first question. And um, I think my uh, second question about this is whether you actually have applied this method to an actual field and what kind of results you got by doing that. Yeah, okay. Thank you for your question. So to answer your first question, basically the WFI or the well fuzzy index is not necessary all the three fluid production data. It is basically the parameters. For example, uh, if I consider uh, total fluid production or the current production rate, something like that, and then I can have other pro uh, same like oil production, then I can also check oil production for the best three months of oil production, like what were the three months the production was best. So it is not necessarily all the fluids parameter taken together. It depends upon me what parameters like I can take uh, them as well together. But the thing is, uh, it is basically all the parameters out of which I can take. It is not uh, necessarily the depends on the fluid which I'm taking to monitor. But uh, it is important that I for a, like a, getting good results, it, it is definitely important that I keep a check on the water production as well as the oil production simultaneously. That will give me a balanced view of the output. So that is recommended. And so to the second question uh, you asked whether I have, uh, okay, so I have applied this. Uh, actually, I worked uh, as an internship here at uh, ONGC, Oil and Natural Gas Corporation India. And where they were. They Hello everyone, my name model. is Hassan Abrora from Gupki University in Tashkent, and the theme of my research work is simulation of a cyclone separate. I'm sorry about that. So your time is up. Sorry. Thanks, Saranj. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, next up, for we now move on to Kassan Abrov from win of the Russian and Caspian paper contest. Hello everyone, my name is Hassan Abrorov from Gupkin University in Tashkent and the theme of my research work is simulation of a cyclone separator to improve the efficiency of gas purification from mechanical impurities. And contributors to my work are Dr. Bulat Andrei, scientific research supervisor and Hassan Abrorov, 3D modeling and printing assistant. The main proposal of this work is suggest possible ways to improve the efficiency of the gas purification system at the gas condensate field. And to achieve this purpose, we've got several tasks. They are study the current natural gas treatment system at the field, make a theoretical calculation of a cyclone separator for changing field conditions, and create and analyze a solid model of a designed cyclone separator. Here you can see the schematic diagram of gas purification system at the field. So the gas enters to the horizontal separator where it divides from the 
condensate and war and then gas flows to the vertical separator when the impurities with 8 to 10 microns are separated from gas flow and then gas goes to the filter separator when the 3 to 5 microns impurities are separated and then gas goes to the booster station where it's compressed and discharged to the pipe. So the main issue on this purification system is that the vertical separa uh, separator has a uh, reduced efficiency due to changing conditions at the field. Uh, these conditions are the decreasing gas flow and the pressure at the gas field, gas condensate field. So the reduced efficiency leads to the very uh, fast contamination of filter separator which leads to the quick change of the filter elements of filter separator and during the operation when we couldn't shut down the booster station we can use the bypassing the filter separator but after several times it leads to the contamination of the dry gas seals of the compressors on the booster station and this contamination of dry gas seals leads to the friction and very high vibrations on the shaft of compressors which also leads to the shutdown of the compressors it means the shutdown of all the purification station to avoid these situations we suggest to use the group placement of the cyclone separators instead of using vertical separator here you can see the calculation of the parameters of the cyclone separator here you can see input and output pressure, volumetric flow, velocity, and we suggest to use the number of cyclones, which is equal to 6. The calculation of geometric parameters were done using the NeoGas method. Here you can see all the geometric parameters, heads, diameters, mass flow, particle density, impurity content in the gas flow and also the static pressure and inlet volumetric flow. After using this method, we've got several uh, theoretical parameters uh, which were used during the modeling, our 3D model. Here we can see the solid model which were done in the solid work uh, software and then after um, getting the model, we used the uh, flow simulation with the mechanical particles in the gas flow and here you can see the patterns of velocity and pressure in the cross section of this model and then here you can see the animation of the uh, gas flow here you can see that gas enters to the separator spinning and goes down separated from the mechanical impurities and here you can see that uh, none of the six microns particles goes to the uh, exhaust pipe, pipe. All the impurities goes to the drain pipe and it's guaranteed the uh, separation coefficient of our cyclone separator. Here you can see the model efficiency analysis. So in our case, we used one to 10 microns particles uh, during our flow simulation and here you can see the dependence of the separation coefficient on the gas flow rate and the inlet uh, to the device and it's obvious that uh, during the decreasing flow rate and the inlet to the separation we've got the separation decreasing separation coefficient so to avoid this situation, we suggest to shut down one of the six uh, cyclone separators to uh, save the optimal uh, inlet velocity. After this, we uh, used the 3D diffusing uh, models. We designed a 3D model and prot prototyping this, but uh, our designed and printed model uh, which were aimed to prove the theoretical calculations uh, couldn't be used due to the COVID-19 and it's, uh, also we couldn't conduct the laboratory test and obtain practical data due to COVID-19 restrictions. Conclusions. The operating system of natural gas purification at the field was studied. The possible methods for increasing the efficiency of gas separation 
due to the use of group placement of cyclone separators is proposed. Theoretical calculations of a cyclone separator were made for changing conditions at the field and created a solid model of the design cyclone separator in the SOLIDWORKS software, computer simulation of a gas flow with the presence of mechanical impurities of various particle size distribution was carried out, which confirmed the effectiveness of the proposed method. And by increasing the rate of the gas entry into the cyclone separator from 11 to 13 meters per second to uh, 20 meters per second, it was found that the diameter of guaranteed separa separated mechanical particles decreased from 8 to 10 microns in the vertical separator to 5 to 6 microns in the cyclone separator. Thus, the separation coefficient increased by 37.5%. Thank you for your attention. Okay, um, dear judges, if you could kindly unmute yourselves and turn on your cameras if you have questions for him. Um, Abramo, I've made you a co-host so you can unmute yourself and you can turn on your camera now. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Thank you, thank you, Hassan, for this uh, presentation and for this interesting work. Uh, just, uh, I, I want to ask you, so you fabricated the cyclone, the proposed cyclone as a vertical separator using 3D printer, right? Yes, yes, it's right. So what, what was the material used for the fabrication and does the selection of the material or the type of the material affect the performance of the cyclone? Uh, that, uh, that was the ABS plastic, and that was just for sampling is the, uh, the geometrical parameters of our cyclone separator is right. After that, we can provide a slightly laboratory test and then give it to the uh, equipment factory, which will uh, uh, product the cyclone separator from the stainless steel or uh, uh, simple steel for the... Uh, practical use, but due to, as I mentioned in my presentation, due to COVID-19 restrictions, we couldn't provide these tests. Okay, but at least like theoretically, does such uh, calculation or evaluation for like the stainless steel cyclone have been conducted? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, hi, Kaijan. So I just wanted to make a recommendation in the future based on the paper that you presented. So I think our equipment uh, data sheet will have helped us as well. So we could have seen the specific uh, dimensions of the cyclone that you would have implemented in the field, as well as Marissa asked about the type of material of the cyclone. And mm -hmm. also in your paper, you went into a lot of details into the uh, um. The, your methodology and you should have summarized it and put all that details into your appendix so that uh, um, it would be more concise to understand what exactly you were doing. Mm -hmm. That was just two points. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any more questions for Kazan? Hi Kazan, this is uh, Kuntal. Um, since you mentioned of COVID on your project, I would like to ask you what was the most challenging step in the whole process, in the whole research work that, uh, that you would want to point us point out to us, which yeah. would, uh, would be, I mean, something to improve upon for the way forward. Thanks. Thank you for your question. The most challenging uh, point was the finding opti optimal geometric parameters. First of all, uh, in the first approach, we used uh, the neo gas met methodology, and then we simulated a model using the SOLIDWORKS software, but the result uh, was not so good. And then we started to change uh, all the geometric parameters and the making our uh, own uh, cyclone separator. That was very challenging. And we done a lot of the uh, uh, simulations and changed uh, a lot of types of the cyclones. So it takes a lot of time to do that. 
and the the all we uh, uh, concluded that it's optimal to use the uh, six uh, cyclones instead of uh, four or eight. And then we uh, concluded that the uh, this uh, cyclone separator uh, with the uh, geometrical parameters which were uh, taken from the model that was the most uh, appropriate for our conditions, field yeah. conditions. Because due to the uh, decreasing of the flow and the pressure in the inlet to our uh, purification system, the uh, efficiency of the purification station at all goes down uh, year by year. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Kazan. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, Kazan, thank you very much. Um, so while the clock winds down, um, we would now like to move on to Ahmed Al Agnaf, winner of the Middle East contest. So he's coming up next. The judges can now turn off their cameras until the next round of questions. Hello, my name is Ahmed al from Texas A&M University, Qatar, and this presentation will be about the effect of ultrasonic waves on drilling fluid foaming. Just to go through the overview of this presentation, the presentation is broken down into four parts, starting with the problem. I'll be talking about one of the problems that is faced during the drilling stages. Second is a proposed idea that could tackle this problem and the aspiration, what this research hopes to bring to the drilling industry. Third is the theory and methodology of this research. This is where I'll discuss the science behind this research and the methods that was used to achieve it. And finally is the result of this research. I'll discuss the findings and observation with addition to future work if this research is carried out further. As the title of this research suggests, the emphasis of this research is on foam. And to avoid any future confusion, I will briefly mention where foam lies within the petroleum industry. Foam is one of the numerous methods for enhanced oil recovery, which has various beneficial characteristics that can increase production. However, this research focuses on the effect of foam on the drilling aspect and the complications that occur with foam being present in the drilling fluid. Now, foam can be described as gas enclosed in a layer of liquid. In petroleum engineering, making drilling fluid is an essential cycle in operations. And when drilling fluid is formulated, foam is present within it, is inevitable. Here, the figure gives a visual representation of this. The arrows represent the drilling fluid and how it circulates during the process. And with the fluid, and with the fluid foam will also be present within the system. In conventional drilling, these foams can cause problems such as strokes to the pump due to, due to the diffusion of foam during pumping. And it can also increase the chloride content of the drilling fluid, which drilling engineers want to avoid. The most common solutions to solve these problems are chemical additives such as deformers and thinners, and also a mechanical solution by submerging the equipment under water to prevent the foam from diffusing. However, all of these methods require additional steps during operations, which increases the time and overall cost. Now this research proposes a new method for removing foam and drilling fluid, which is by the application of ultrasonic waves. With the goal of this method is to reduce the time and cost of operations, which will greatly benefit companies. <clears throat> the theory behind this is a process called ultrasonication, which applies ultrasonic waves to a fluid that causes agitation to the particles. During ultrasonication, there are two regions at which waves form, which are compression and refraction, and this can be seen in the figure. In the compression region, the bubble particles are compressed and are and are at the closest distance between them. Whereas in the refraction region, the bubble particles are at the furthest distance between them. The transformation of the bubbles can be seen in the bottom of the figure, where the small red bubbles represent compression and the big pink bubbles represent refraction. Eventually, as the time of the ultrasonication increases, the bubbles will reach a maximum possible distance in the refraction region and collapse. For this experiment, a Herschel UIP 1500HD was used, as shown in the figure, to apply ultrasonic waves to the drilling fluid. The drilling fluid was exposed for five minutes to the, to the ultrasonic waves, 
and at various amplitudes of 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90 percent. <clears throat> Here I'm going to talk about the drinking fluid that was used for the experiment, which is a water-based mud, and the formulation of the mud can be seen on the, in the table. The reason for studying water-based mud is because it's the main mud type used in copper drilling operations. What I want to note is that the addition of oil was taken into account as 1, 2, and 3% of the formulated drilling fluid volume. The purpose for this is because during drilling operations, it should be expected that a carryover will occur. As you can see in the figure on the right, oil will carry over during the operation and will be circulated throughout the process, which means that the oil content of the drilling fluid will increase during operations. Therefore, this experiment has taken this into account. Let's move on to how I evaluated the effective ultrasonic waves on drilling fluid. The first thing I looked at was a visual reduction in terms of foam before and after the application of ultrasonic waves. The way this was done was by placing the drilling mud in a 100 milliliter graduated cylinder as shown in the figure. And to give, and to give a quantitative value, I measured the foam level from the cylinder giving a value between 0 to 100. Then I studied the change in fluid properties, more specifically the rheology model, viscosity, and gel strength. The rheology model describes the flow behavior and how the fluid viscous forces act, while viscosity is known as the resistance of the fluid to flow, and gel strength is the ability of the drilling fluid to form in gel in static conditions. <clears throat> These properties of a drilling fluid was found by using a fan 35 viscometer, as shown in the figure. The viscometer is a six-speed uh, uh, six model measuring at 3, 6, 100, 200, 300, and 600 revolutions per minute, meaning that it measures dial readings at these various rotor speeds. The data that was taken from the viscometer is theta, which is the dial reading, and omega, the rotor speed. <clears throat> from there, the viscosity of the drilling fluid can be calculated using the first equation. The shear stress and shear rate are found by using the second and third equations, where the dial reading and rotor speeds are found directly from the fan 35 viscometer. The gel strength of the fluid at 10 seconds and 10 minutes are found at readings of 3 RPM. To find the gel strength, the viscometer is turned off for both 10 seconds and 10 minutes and then turned back on at 3 RPM. The highest reading is the gel strength. Both the shear stress and shear rate that was found, help, that was found helped to develop rheological models. The figure on this slide shows the graph of the shear stress versus shear rate for various rheological models. Drilling engineers generally use um, rheological models such as Newtonian, Bingham Plastic, Power Law, and Herschel Buckley to predict the flow behavior. <clears throat> the Herschel Buckley is the preferred rheological model for drilling fluids, which is why I've measured the drilling fluid after. The reason for Herschel Buckley being the preferred model is because it takes into account the yield stress and shear thinning, while other models do not. The Herschel Buckley model of uh, equation and the naming of its parameters are shown on the slide. Now we have reached the results section. As mentioned previously, experiments of various amplitudes at different oil percentages were conducted. For the sake of time, I have grouped the amplitudes into two parts. The first part consists of 50 and 60% amplitude, since they have the same trends. So the results you will see throughout the presentation will be based on 60% amplitude. And uh, with 50% with in the appendix section. The second part is 70, 80, and 90% amplitude, since they have similar trends. So the results for this section will consist of 90% amplitude, with 70 and 80% will be in the appendix for reference. I want to emphasize that all the amplitudes in the same section have similar results at the same oil percentage, percentages. <clears throat> Here I'll be discussing the foam level of the drilling fluid before and after the application of ultrasonic waves. The two pictures here are the results for 60% amplitude. The arrows pointing out of the figure indicate that the, le the level at which the foam is present in the cylinder. And it can be seen that the level of placement of the foam increased from 81 from before to a level of 96 at after, which shows that the foam in the drilling fluid decreased immensely, indicating that ultrasonication can reduce the amount of foam in drilling fluids. These same trends are also seen at 50% amplitude. <clears throat> now the figure to the right is the result of 90% amplitude. 
The foam level went from 88 to 97. However, as you can see from the white box in the after picture, segregation begins to occur. The picture on the slide shows the same drilling fluid at 90% amplitude from the previous slide. As you can see, as more time passes after the application of ultrasonic waves, the more segregation occurs. This of itself is an interesting finding. However, this disrupts the integrity of the drilling fluid. Both the solid and liquid content are being separated, which indicates that the application of ultrasonic waves above 60% should not be advised since it would not be beneficial for drilling fluids. For this slide, we have the viscosity graph for 60% amplitude at different oil volumes. With the viscosity in the y-axis and the shear rate in the x-axis, as you can see here, there is a decrease in viscosity. However, it is very little. And for drilling engineers, this is considered to be a good thing since drilling engineers would want to keep the integrity of the drilling fluid viscosity the same. The, these same trends can, are also seen at 50% amplitude. Now, the figure to the right is the viscosity graph for 90% amplitude. You can see here that the red after line shifts downward significantly more, especially at lower shear rates, which could cause problems for drilling engineers who would want to keep the viscosity integrity the same. This could, this could potentially be due to the segregation that occurs. The rheologic model of the drilling fluid at 60% amplitude are shown in the figure, with the shear stress in the y-axis and shear rate in the x-axis. And as mentioned previously, I modeled the drilling fluid after the Herschel-Buckley model. <clears throat> and as you can see, there is a distinct downward shift in all red afterlines for the drilling fluid. This is due to the decrease in shear stress from the ultrasonic wave. The figure to the right is the rheological model's graph for 90% amplitude and it can also be seen that it follows the same trend. However, there is a far greater shift at higher amplitudes. Since I mentioned that the fluids are based on the Herschel-Buckley model, the equation parameters for before and after ultrasonic waves at 60% amplitude are shown in the table. This table might seem overwhelming. However, to summarize it, we can see that the yield stress and consistency factor both decrease due to the ultrasonic waves whereas the curvature exponent n stayed the same. These same trends are also seen at 50% 50, 50 amplitude. For drilling engineers, the decrease in yield stress is favorable since that it means that the drilling fluid requires less force to make the fluid flow. Now, similarly for 90% uh, amplitude, we can see that the yield stress and consistency factor both decrease due to ultrasonic waves while the curvature exponent at 0, 1, and 2% all volume increase, which could be due to the, de to the segregation. Finally, we have the gel strength. The before and after of the gel strength for 10 seconds and 10 minutes at 60% amplitude are shown in the graph. The blue bar represents the gel strength at 10 seconds, and the orange bar represents the gel strength at 10 minutes. As you can see from the graph, the gel strength decreases after the application of ultrasonic waves. These same trends are also seen at 50% amplitude. <clears throat> now the figure to the right is the gel strength graph for 90% amplitude. You can see that it also follows the same trend with both the gel strength at 10 seconds and 10 minutes decreased. This decrease is beneficial for drilling engineers. The reason to that is because it if operations is halted or interrupted, less pumping pressure will be required to resume operations. Here, I would like to briefly talk about where an, where, an, where an ultrasonic device can be applied in a drilling rig. The best possible location for an ultrasonic device would be right before the mud pump, which is before the mud is pumped back into the, into the well. The reason for this is because placing the device in this location, it can apply ultrasonic waves to the circulating mud and also to the new mixed mud. And as mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, applying ultrasonic waves is a new method to remove foam. So the time that is applied mixing the foamers, which is the most common method, can be reduced by applying ultrasonic waves. 
to fully understand the effects of ultrasonic waves has on our, on a drilling fluid, future studies should fo be focused on the change of sand content, high pressure, high temperature fluid, fluid loss, and pH measurements. Studying, studying these fluid properties can help support the justification of applying ultrasonic waves on a drilling fluid. The phenomena of 70, 80, and 90% amplitudes segregating the fluid, the fluid should be studied further as it could have the potential to be effective in other sectors of the petroleum industry. <clears throat> now I'll be wrapping up the presentation with a summary. I discussed the problem, which is foam being present in the drilling fluid, which causes issues in operations such as causing the pump to stroke and increasing the mud chloride content. The novelty of the study is that ultrasonic waves can be a new innovating method for removing foam in drilling fluid, with the aspiration that it will have a positive impact on drilling operations and reduce the time and overall costs. I studied the before and after effects of ultrasonic waves and its impact on the rheology model, rheology of the fluid at various amplitudes and oil volumes. Amplitudes of 50 and 60% show the same trends, which is reduction of foam within the fluid, and there is also a decrease in shear stress, yield stress, and gel strength, with little change on the viscosity of the fluid, showing positive signs that this method can be capable of being an effective method of removing foam. Whereas, I also discussed how amplitudes of 70, 80, and 90% segregated the drilling fluid and greatly decreased the viscosity, meaning that these high amplitudes can cause issues during drilling operations. <clears throat> I want to take a moment to thank my mentor, Dr. Mahmoud Amani, for guiding me throughout the research project and aiding in all difficulties that I faced during the project, and for also encouraging me to submit this work to the student paper contest. I would also like to thank Qatar National Research Fund for funding this research through, uh, through the Undergraduate Research Experience Program. Uh, here are the references that were, that were used throughout the presentation. And thank you for listening. I'm ready for any questions. Thank you, Ahmed. And now over to the judges. Um, do you have any questions for Ahmed? Hello. Yes, I have a question uh, about the scalability of the application of this. This is interesting. Indeed, that uh, you can reduce the foam uh, from drilling fluid. And can you observe and also estimate or correlate that, that uh, in the scalable industry for the drilling fluid, the ultrasonic uh, treatment like this at the volume is uh, like scalable with uh, your your experiments in the laboratory? Uh, just to um, make sure I understand the question, you're asking if. Uh, uh, applying ultrasonic waves to a larger batch of drilling fluid is uh, just as successful as a uh, 100 milliliters. Is that your question? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, um, uh, obviously, I have, haven't presented this in the presentation. However, during the drilling, uh, during the lab, I have experimented of trying to reduce the foam in a larger batch. However, I obviously, because you need something clear to physically, uh, visually see the reduction of foam, uh, I can only see that the foam on the top level of the, of the box where I experimented the huge amount of drilling fluid, it reduced significantly. However, uh, experimenting that on, uh, on uh, visually was very difficult since I have to remove that big uh, jug to uh, another part. But... Uh, uh, I'm pretty confident that this can be applied in a larger scale, uh, especially since the ultrasonic waves has been around, being used in the food industry and uh, pharmaceutical industry. So it has great potential to uh, remove a certain um, uh, remove foam. Thank you. Uh, hello, Ahmed. Uh, I have a question. Jamaica. I'm sorry. Sorry, uh, so, uh, thank you so much That's for a very wonderful presentation. Uh, just a quick question from me. Um, I know you're trying to um, introduce this as a way of um, affecting the bottom line uh, for a drilling uh, using the FOMA versus using this. Uh, 
do you maybe have an idea as far as costs, um, how much uh, you can potentially save by using this versus using the foamers for drilling? Uh, yeah, um, unfortunately, I don't have exact costs since um, that would require me to have access to a drilling company's uh, financial you know, uh, book reports. However, if you think about it, ultrasonic, buying an ultrasonic device is a one-time payment uh, between $50,000 compared to consistently buying the foamers on a regular basis. And the foamers nowadays are very expensive, even in smaller batches. So buying it in, when you're drill, using in drilling operations, it's going to require significant costs. And obviously, we all know drilling and drilling takes the significant amount of cost during the whole cycle of the petroleum uh, operations. So, and the foamers, obviously play a huge part, chemicals. I mean, yeah. that's how drilling muds are made. So it just compare, think about a one-time payment versus continuous, continuous payment. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Maisa, we'll uh, take a question, yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, thank you for the great uh, presentation. It's uh, an interesting idea. And uh, I hope it sees uh, like uh, soon, uh, application in the field. Uh, my question regarding the experimental protocol approach to measure the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the column, uh, the length of the foam column. So in the experimental approach, you uh, like you placed the, the mud in the chamber and then it was subjected to the ultrasonic waves at different uh, amplitude percentage. Okay, after the application, did you shear the, the mud or you shaked it or something because usually foaming, uh, it's more like observed after the uh, the mud being pumped through the the bits where it's under high shearing. So the measurement of the foam column it was like after shearing or maybe shaking it or something to to mimic or simulate what's happening in the in the field. Especially that you you suggested that the ultra Sonic to be subjected immediately before or uh, during the mud pump, so like at the top of the string. Yeah, um, unfortunately, time is coming up, but if I have, I can just answer that question. As I think, um, yeah. yeah, the um, we have taken, uh, so I have taken this into account uh, when it when it comes to measuring the foam within the cylinder and to give an applicant as much as I can, an accurate representation as of what it would be in a drilling, uh, on a drilling rig. But um, the way I did it was I, um, met, I mimicked the exact way a drilling fluid would be mixed in a drilling rig. Uh, and from there, that's how I took, and then that's how I uh, took the value of the drilling fluid volume. But uh, the shearing, I have not taken that into account. And that's actually a very good uh, observation. I have not taken that into account. And thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, it, it, can be, it can be a recommendation, yeah. At the next stage. Yeah. Continue on this work. It's thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. We now move on to Nandana, winner of the Europe Regional Paper Contest. Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation. I am Nandana and today I'll be discussing a unified parameter to represent reservoir heterogeneity. A big thank you to SB International for this opportunity and my supervising professor, Dr. Daruk Alp, for guiding me during this research. Let's begin. Starting with the outline, we have the subsections of each section to the right. I will begin with the introduction and our objectives. Then I will move on to the methodology, data, and results before finishing up with the conclusion and potential applications of this research. So in our studies, we will be using computer simulations to model a quarter of a five-spot pattern for water flooding. This is for the sake of simplicity. Uh, we will be investigating the effects of vertical heterogeneity, meaning how permeability changes as we move down across layers. We will quantify the degree of heterogeneity of the reservoir using the Lorentz coefficient and unifying them using the radar chart area. 
This is a diagonal cross section from an injector well to a producer well for one of the quarters of a five spot pattern. We'll be using ratios and other dimensionless variables to quantify our results in order to make it as universal as possible. For each layer, we'll be studying vertical and horizontal permeability. We will set porosity, initial diagonal pressure ratio, as well as well specifications such as flow rate and perforations unchanged in all of our experiments. We will be studying two effects of permeability. They are thief zones and cross flow between layers. For the purpose of this research, we have ignored the effects of capillary pressure. Our performance parameters will be recovery factor and water cut. Our heterogeneity parameters are the Lorentz coefficient, permeability ratios, and radar chart area. In most, if not all, recorded literature, the Lorentz coefficient is used for horizontal permeability. In this research, we will also be using it for vertical permeability. The radar chart area will then be used to study the combined effects of both thief zones and cross flow between layers. To model heterogeneity of permeability and to take into account layer thickness, we use the Lorentz coefficient. The x-axis shows cumulative thickness and the y-axis shows cumulative flow capacity. The formulas for cumulative flow capacity as well as cumulative thickness are shown on this slide. The Lorentz coefficient is two times the area between a slope of one, which represents a perfectly homogeneous reservoir, and the curve generated by the reservoir being studied. To use the radar chart area, we need variables that are normalized between zero and one. Here we include the Lorentz coefficient of vertical and horizontal permeability, then average porosity, which is kept constant, and initial diagonal pressure ratio which is also kept constant. For reference purposes, of course, uh, we then sum up each triangle created by two points and the center of the radar chart area to get the total area. In this case, we have four triangles. To study the effects of heterogeneity on Lorentz coefficient and performance parameters, this figure shows a diagonal cross section from our injector well to our producer well with respect to oil saturation. Please note that the higher permeability regions are located in the upper parts of the reservoir. These are just two shots from two of our trials. Of course, we did much more than that. As you can see, uh, as we increase heterogeneity, so does the Lorentz coefficient, which in turn results in a lower recovery factor and an earlier breakthrough. Here we have two plots showing pore volume injected in the x-axis and the recovery factor and water cut in the y-axis. Here we can see that as heterogeneity increases, so does the Lorentz coefficient, which in turn leads to lower recovery factor and earlier breakthrough. Also, the changes in slope of recovery factor are due to the breakthrough of each individual layer. Higher permeability regions break through first, followed by layers with lower permeabilities. To study the effects of thief zones, this figure compares two different ratios of horizontal permeability of the thief zone over the average horizontal permeability of the entire reservoir. Please note that the thief zones are on the upper parts of the reservoir. As you can see, the higher the ratio, the larger the unswept zone is. This is because all the water being injected is being taken by the thief layer. Here we have the permeability ratio and Lorentz coefficient in the x-axis and the recovery factor and water cut in the y-axis. Again, understandably, the higher the permeability of the thief zone, the lower the recovery factor and the higher the water cut. In this figure, we compare ratios of vertical permeability over horizontal permeability to study the effects of cross flow between layers. Here we see that the greater the vertical permeability, the more the water drains down to the lower parts of the reservoir. This results in an earlier breakthrough of the lowest layer, and this is accompanied by a more curved flood front and undertonguing. This also means a lower sweep efficiency. Please note that in real life, KV over KH ratio is usually never greater than one unless it's a fracture. During our trials, we wanted to see how these ratios would impact recovery factor. These two plots show vertical and horizontal permeability ratios in the x-axis and recovery factor and water cut in the y-axis. For reference, the legend shows increasing horizontal permeability. Please note that in this part of our experiment, the KV over KH ratio was increased uniformly in all the layers and not individually. 
This data shows that after a certain ratio, approximately kV over kH uh, equal to 1 over 10, the, there will be no improvement or change in recovery factor or water cut. In the following slides, we will be studying the combined effects of both thief zones and cross flow. To do that, we'll be using the radar chart area as an index of heterogeneity. Our radar chart includes the Lorentz coefficient of vertical permeability and horizontal permeability, as well as initial diagonal pressure ratio, which is kept constant, and their average porosity, which is also kept constant. As you can see, as heterogeneity increases, so does the radar chart area. In this figure, we compare two different values of the radar chart area. Here we see that as heterogeneity increases, so does the radar chart area. This results in a low recovery factor and a higher water cut. And this is also accompanied by an earlier breakthrough. And although it may be hard to see, we do have some undertonguing in the higher permeability regions, which in this case is in the upper parts of the reservoir. These two plots show the pore volume injected in the x-axis and recovery factor and water cut in the y-axis. The legend shows the respective values of the radar chart area of each trial from the reservoirs of increasing heterogeneity. Results show that as RCA increases, recovery factor decreases. The change in slope of recovery factor is due to individual layer breakthrough. The fluctuations in water cut are also due to layer breakthrough. The more heterogeneous, the bigger the difference between permeability in each layer. This results in a longer gap between fluctuations of water cut due to the breakthroughs. Here we did more trials, but this time we used greater values of the radar chart area due to greater degree of heterogeneity. We have the same trends as the last two slides. Uh, greater RCA is accompanied by a lower recovery factor and a higher water cut, along with an earlier breakthrough and other tonguing in high permeability regions, which in this case, again, is in the upper parts of the reservoir. This is again uh, accompanied by a lower sweep efficiency. As you can see, with greater numbers come greater changes. Uh, these two plots show pore volume in injected in the x-axis and recovery factor and water cut in the y-axis. Again, we see that with increasing radar chart area comes lower recovery factor. The changes in the slope of recovery factor are due to individual layer breakthrough. The fluctuations in water cut are also due to layer breakthrough. Greater heterogeneity means greater difference between permeability in each layer. This results in a longer gap between fluctuations in water cut due to breakthrough. So what did we learn from all this? Well, for demonstration purposes, this figure illustrates the importance of using the radar chart area as a parameter to unify heterogeneity parameters of a reservoir, this being the Lorentz coefficient of vertical and horizontal permeability. Here we see that both have the same Lorentz coefficient, but have different radar chart area. If we only use the Lorentz coefficient based on horizontal permeability to gauge the recovery performance, like in previous works of literature, we would have missed the opportunity to diagnose our reservoir model more accurately. The figure below shows that due to heterogeneity and vertical permeability layers, there is an earlier breakthrough and a lower sweep efficiency due to undertonguing. Please note that high permeability regions are in the upper parts of the reservoir. The plot on top shows general relationships between uh, the radar chart area and the recovery factor. Here we can clearly see that for the same pore volume injected, we have a lower recovery factor with increasing radar chart area. In short, as overall heterogeneity increases, so does radar chart area. This is accompanied by a lower recovery factor, higher water cut, earlier breakthrough, and undertonguing in high permeability regions, which results in a lower sweep efficiency. The trials also show that high permeability doesn't necessarily mean high recovery. Uh, we see that the radar chart area can be applied to other properties so long as it's normalized between 0 and 1. Our investigations also show that reservoir heterogeneity can be inferred backwards from recovery factor and water cut, as shown through the changes in slope due to individual layer breakthrough. Results from the radar chart area may also be compared with tracer studies. Well, as I've said earlier, uh, heterogeneity can be inferred backwards from recovery factor and water cut. To do this, we can use a similar technique to type curve matching. 
Also, since radar chart area combines both heterogeneity of vertical permeability and horizontal permeability, we can estimate uh, KH through well tests and index it with the radar chart area to estimate uh, KV or vice versa. After quantifying the degree of heterogeneity of the reservoir, we can then optimize water flooding operations. This may include uh, zonal water injection uh, instead of injecting all layers when we have thief zones, uh, or it may include uh, changing the direction of fluid flow to sweep bypass oil. So here are the resources I used in my research. Please feel free to pause the screen to take a closer look. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. I would like to give my thanks to my supervising professor, Dr. Daluk Alp, for guiding me during this research and as well as my friends for their support. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, thank you all for watching. Thank you very much, Nandana, for your presentation. I'll just make you a co-host now. So um, over to the judges. Um, could I ask that you can you turn on your videos and unmute yourself if you have a question for Nandana. Nandana, you're now a co-host. So please turn on your camera and unmute yourself for your questions. Over to you, judges. Judges, any question for Nandana? Hello, hello, Nandana. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm asked that uh, as you mentioned that you use for the five spot patterns, right? Question. So you 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 stated that uh, you use the five spots pattern, right, for your for the yes, flooding. Yes, yes, yes I mean, actually, uh, how you. Uh, how you uh, imagine that the, the replication of this method can be also applied for the pattern, like the, even the irregular one? You mean other patterns? Yes. Right. I mean, uh, my objective was to provide a universal parameter, right? So if we want to try this in other patterns, we would have to do the same research, the same approach. So we just have to do it all over again and then see the trends that it makes and then, uh, you know, make an index. Okay, thank you. Hi, hi Nandana, this is Kuntal. Um, mm. I want to ask, uh, have you tried applying this to any particular kind of reservoirs? For example, carbonates, which are very well known to be extremely heterogeneous. Um, the, in the simulation, I used carbonates. I used limestone. So the setting was uh, limestone. I didn't, yeah. Was it, was it like particular limestone? Because carbonates can be limestone, dolostone, mix of dolostone and limestone, etc. So yeah. I would know what particular exact case did you apply to? And uh, outcome. That was the setting on my computer. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions? Nandana. If there are no more questions for him, thank you very much for your presentation, Nandana. Thank you this so much. It's a pleasure. You're welcome. This brings us to a close of the first half of the Students' Paper Contest. We're now going to give you and the judges a well-deserved break. We'll be starting the next series of presentations at 16.30 Dubai Gulf Standard Time, which is approximately 90 minutes from your time region now. So for me in London, that is 1.30. Um, so um, for where you are, um, nine, 90 minutes from now. So we'll reconvene at that time. Um, I'm going to leave uh, a holding slide up so that you don't need to log back in or anything. So you can just or mute yourselves and turn off your videos and just go away if you want. So we'll reconvene in exactly 90 minutes from now. Hola, sorry, did you say one nine or nine zero? Nine zero, 90, 90 minutes. Oh, okay, perfect. 
90 minutes. Sounds great. Thanks. All right. I'll see you all shortly. Have a good break.
So, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we have three more session on presentations for this afternoon session. If everyone is ready, we will now start with Anthony Small, winner of the Gulf Coast North Africa Paper Contest. Hi, my name is Anthony Small, and today I'm going to present to you a study I conducted that shows that practical reservoir simulation aids everyday decision making at an oil and gas company. So in my project, I've established models as valid substitutes for full scale reservoir simulation. And in this presentation, I'm going to be outlining a technique that can be used to improve decision making for unconventional resource play development. And the technique is a very efficient, practical way to forecast production in, in unconventionals using reservoir simulation. Now, this allows us to incorporate a rigorous, phys rigorous physics-based approach to production forecasting that maintains accuracy while being much more time efficient in terms of both model construction time and runtime than conventional reservoir simulation. And we do this via the use of proxy modeling. Now, I've found that these proxy models are an excellent approximation to full-scale simulation while being much faster and simpler than full-scale simulation. So as a result, these proxy models are incredibly useful for real-time decision-making, such as development planning, budgeting, and portfolio optimization. And furthermore, they are useful for short fuse projects, such as asset valuation, as well as prospecting and acquisitions. And ultimately, the application of this technique will lead to better decisions in the multi-million and billion dollar development programs that EMP companies are implementing today. So over the last decade, drilling activity in the United States has been dominated by the horizontal development of resource plays. Now, it's been a significant learning curve for all the companies involved because they had to figure out how to drill these wells, how to complete them, what inner well spacing to use, where to land them, and a lot of other things too. So we've had a lot of very smart people spending a tremendous amount of money trying to make very quick decisions on how to optimally develop these plays. And all the plays are different from one another. So this process has involved a considerable amount of trial and error. And the typical workflow has been the following. So first, engineers will build on everything they've learned to the present day, and they'll design a program to spend tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars drilling and completing wells with a certain well spacing or completion design. And they'll then evaluate the results using data analytics and realize that they could have done a better job. So then they'll decide on a new development strategy to employ, and this cycle repeats over and over again. So what we've had happen is that companies have iterated through multiple generations of well spacing and completion designs to arrive at what they deem today to be the current best practices. So this is not ideal, but it's very commonplace in the industry today. So what are our options to improve this current decision-making process? So we can continue Continue with more data analytics and statistical techniques and do more iterations of a brute force trial and error approach, or we can potentially use reservoir simulation. So let's compare these two approaches. So first off, data analytics is great at interpolation in that you can use it to accurately predict within the bounds of an existing data set. Now, the problem with it though, is that it fails at extrapolation because it cannot accurately accurately predict outside the bounds of the known data set because it's statistics, it's not engineering. So for example, how will an untested well spacing or completion design perform that's outside the bounds of what's been tested before? Well, if you've never done it before, you can make an educated guess by extrapolating, but this kind of approach is not going to result in a decision that you would be confident in. Now, on the other hand, reservoir simulation would be better because it's a physics-based model. So you can make predictions outside the bounds of existing data because it's grounded in hard engineering science. However, the conventional wisdom in the industry today is that reservoir simulation is not practical for real-time decision-making in these complex resource plays. And many operators view it as very cumbersome because 
It's too time consuming. It requires a huge amount of data that most operators don't want to pay to collect. And it requires considerable effort and prior experience to be done properly. So reservoir simulation would be ideal, but most EMP companies just don't have all the time and data necessary. So what's the solution? The solution is to make the simulation more practical. And how can we do that? We can do that by using proxy reservoir simulation models. So what is this proxy res reservoir simulation model? Well, it will subdivide the reservoir simulation model into elements of symmetry. So for example, in a multi-stage hydraulically fractured horizontal well, the element of symmetry could be one stage and its associated reservoir drainage area. So then you would run the simulation and then upscale the results. So how does this work? Well, you're making two major assumptions. The first, we're assuming a homogeneous reservoir model. And secondly, we are assuming a uniform fracture characterization. So all of the fractures have the same half length and conductivity. Now, the utility of these proxy models comes from their speed and simplicity. So from a runtime standpoint, they typically run on a PC in less than a minute. And the majority of the time savings comes from how fast you can build these models compared to a full scale simulation because they're so much simpler. Now, are there disadvantages, though, to this proxy modeling approach? Well, the perception is, is that this method is oversimplified and it will, will yield incorrect results. Now, this is not true. And hopefully I can convince you of that as I go through my material today. Now, part of the reason for this perception and why proxy models are not in widespread use is because there's simply a lack of validation out there in things like SPE papers and presentations sh showing that they are in fact good proxies of full scale reservoir simulation. And validation is very important because engineers need confidence that the approach they plan to use is going to work. So that way they feel comfortable employing it. Now let's step back for a moment and consider, okay, what's the goal of any modeling effort, including reservoir simulation? The goal is not to generate a perfect forecast because there is no such thing as a perfect forecast. The goal is to generate reasonable forecasts to help engineers and executives make better decisions within a reasonable time frame. And this is exactly what proxy models have the potential to do. So the objective of this project was to conduct a proxy model validation study where I directly tested and compared proxy models against full-scale heterogeneous reservoir simulation models of multi-stage hydraulically fractured horizontal wells. And remember here, the full-scale heterogeneous models have different permeability and porosity values for each grid block and different fracture conductivities and half lengths for each fracture, while the proxy simulation model has only one value for all four of these parameters. Now for the study, I decided to use the CMG software package to model a multi-stage hydraulically fractured horizontal well in an unconventional dry gas reservoir. And the specific model was based on a 50 stage 1.5 mile lateral well. Now, in terms of project workflow, the first step was to build full scale reservoir simulation models with variable porosities and permeabilities to emulate a complex heterogeneous reservoir. And then to simulate an even more complex scenario, I also built and forecasted full scale models with heterogeneous completions. So each frac had a variable half length and conductivity. I then forecasted these models for 40 years of production. And this is the forecast I will be comparing the proxy model to. Now, the next step was to build a proxy model of a single stage and then history matched that proxy model to the first 18 months of monthly production data from the full scale simulation. And once I had a history match proxy model, I would then forecast that out for 40 years of production and then compare that forecast to the full scale simulation forecast. So now I'm gonna briefly discuss how I generated the full scale simulation production profiles. So I built and forecasted a total of 28 different full scale reservoir simulations for the well that I mentioned earlier. Now, in terms of reservoir heterogeneity, I generated seven unique reservoir descriptions with various distributions of permeability and porosity. So for permeability, I used truncated log normal distributions to sample values in the hundreds of nanodarcies up to 10 microdarcy. And the permeability distributions are displayed on the cumulative distribution function plot on the left. And this graph plots the probability that the permeability is greater than or equal to a certain value. And then for each perm, I then calculated a corresponding porosity 
via a semi-log correlation, which bounded the porosity between two and 8%. Now to better emulate real life, I then added considerable noise to the porosity values so they'd be plus or minus a couple percent from the exact correlation as shown on the plot on the right. And so using this approach, I sampled tens of thousands of permeability and porosity values and then added those to my full scale models within CMG. Then after that, I generated four unique completions in which each of the 50 fracs had a different conductivity and half length. And these distributions are shown in the plots below. So the graph on the left plots the probability that the dimensionless fracture conductivity is greater than or equal to a certain value, while the graph on the right plots the probability that the fracture half length is greater than or equal to a certain value for that particular distribution. And to get a wide array of initial decline profiles, I generated frac conductivity and half length distribution, which achieved very different dimensionless fracture conductivity distributions. So for example, as shown on the plot on the left, one of the stimulations had all infinite conductivity fractures, while another had mostly finite conductivity fractures. So combining the seven reservoir descriptions with the four completions, that's what totals the 28 full-scale reservoir simulations. Now, this part of the project took a considerable amount of time because I worked very methodically to increase the heterogeneity of each reservoir and completion description by testing many different distributions for both the reservoir and completion parameters. So then I ran all 28 of these full-scale reservoir simulations to generate the following production profiles. And these are shown in the plot of cumulative gas production versus time. Now, each of these 28 simulations took about an hour to run. And the key thing here is that first, the different descriptions of reservoir heterogeneity enabled me to generate a wide distribution of well EURs that vary between six and nine BCF. And then secondly, the different completions resulted in a wide array of initial decline profiles. Now as shown in the box on the lower left of the plot, the first two years cumulative production ranged between one and a half to four BCF. Now the next step was to history match a proxy model to each full scale simulation production profile. So now I had to history match a proxy model, which is just one stage to the first 18 months of monthly production data for each full scale simulation model. And for the history match, I regressed on three main parameters, matrix permeability, fracture conductivity, and fracture half length. And for each history match, I employed CMG CMOS, CMOS which is a global optimizer for computer-assisted history matching. And to better illustrate how this process works, I'm going to go through an example. So this table here shows the median and mean values for the distribution of each parameter in this particular full-scale simulation model. So I then history matched a proxy model to the first 18 months production of this full-scale simulation. And the optimal history match had these parameters. Now, it's important to note here that the proxy model captures the disparity between the P50 and mean with just a single value. Now I then generated a 40 year production forecast via the proxy simulation model. And after waiting less than a minute for the proxy model to run, the results came in. And this is how they look compared to the production forecast generated by the full scale simulation. Now the forecast is within 2% as shown here on the cumulative gas production versus time plot. Now this is very promising, but it's only a single test. So then I repeated this process of history matching a proxy model to the first 18 months of monthly production from a full scale reservoir simulation 27 more times. And again, the reason I did this is be this many times is because I wanted to see whether proxy models would prove to be consistently accurate. Now to easily display the performance of all 28 of the proxy models relative to the full scale production profiles simultaneously, I created proxy model cumulative gas production error matrices. So this matrix basically shows the error between the proxy model forecast and full scale model forecast at a certain point in time. So this particular matrix on this slide is at five years time in the production forecast. So each column represents a different reservoir description that was used in the full scale simulation model, while each row represents a different completion description that was used in the full scale simulation model. So for instance, the example I just showed in the previous slide was the proxy model for reservoir description five and completion description three. And this proxy model had an error of 3%. Now, as, as observed in the matrix, there was a minuscule difference in the cumulative gas production between the two models at five years time. 
In fact, the average error is only 3% for all 28 iterations at five years time. Now let's look at the error for a 40 year EUR. So as you can see, there are very small differences in the 40 year cumulative gas production between the proxy and full scale models. And moreover, the average error is only 5%. So since these matrices were just snapshots in time, I then created this cumulative gas production error versus time plot that compares the error between the cumulative gas production forecast of all 28 full-scale simulation models and their corresponding proxy models over the entire 40-year forecast life. And as observed in the plot, the cumulative gas production error is within 11% for all 28 iterations. So in summary, proxy models provide a more time efficient means to generate physics-based production forecasts. And in terms of specific application, proxy models can be used to determine an optimal well spacing and completion design. And this allows you to quantify and grade remaining drilling inventory, as well as optimize drill well and full field development rate of return. Now, however, going back to the premise of this entire project, Proxy models can be used to bring physics-based modeling into unconventional resource play analysis for companies that have only used data analytics and statistical methods. So for instance, they can be useful for short fuse projects with a tight timetable, tight timetable, such as asset valuation, as well as prospecting and acquisitions. And most importantly, proxy models can be used to help make real-time decisions at the corporate level for things like budgeting, planning, and portfolio optimization. Now, ultimately, this project established that proxy models are valid substitutes for full-scale simulation. And this technique can be used to improve decision-making and unconventional resource play development, as proxy models have been demonstrated to accur accurately model complex, multi-stage, hydraulically fractured wells and unconventional gas reservoirs. Now, furthermore, this method outperforms alternative forecasting techniques as it speeds up the decision-making process from weeks to months to just days as the reservoir simulation model is much faster and simpler. And the key here is that proxy models do this while still incorporating the power and rigor of physics-based modeling to make predictions outside the bounds of existing data. And ultimately, proxy models can be calibrated and applied to each resource play to optimize the development of unconventional reservoirs. Now, as a final point, in the beginning of this presentation, I talked about why proxy models were not in widespread use because of lack of validation in things like SPE publications. Now, I'm pleased to note here that the validation has already begun. So in the August 2021 JPT, there is an article titled Cyclic Gas Injection EOR, EOR in Eagleford Can Increase Estimated Ultimate Recovery. Now, in this article, the authors discuss building a reservoir simulation proxy model for the average well on a lease. And to do this, they model one half of a fracture, and then using symmetry, the production can be scaled up to the full well profile. Now this is proxy modeling in action. Now this completes my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Anthony. Um, can I now ask the judges to unmute themselves and turn on their cameras? And um, Anthony, I've made you a co-host, so kindly you unmute yourself. And, um, Hi, Anthony. This is uh, um, I have a question on uh, sensitivities. So when you made the proxy models and you ran them, did you consider running sensitivities across the three parameters? I mean, at one point you say that they are very close and accurate. For example, the perm, you show 1.5 millidarcy, micro darcy and 2.3 and your model is somewhere in between. 1.3 and uh, what you are getting is 1.5. So did you try running sensitivities on various parameters to see how off it gets? Does it go like 90%, which, is, which means a 10% off, which, is, which might still be within the practical range of acceptance? Did you try that? Yes, that's a great question. And I was curious about the same thing. So I did in fact do that. And I have a, the best example I have of that is I, I had a full scale simulation that had permeability distribution that had a one micro Darcy median and a three micro Darcy mean. And then I forced the, the history match of my proxy model to not exe exceed half of a micro Darcy. So the perm couldn't even be half of what the median value was. And there was only a 5% uh, error in the production forecast at five years time and a 10% 
um, uh, heir at eight years time. And that's pretty significant because in terms of, you know, using this for economic decisions, the early life production forecast is most impactful to the uh, in net present value of the uh, of the well. So that was the, that was an example of a sensitivity that I didn't, in fact, run on permeability. That's great. And my second part of the question will be uh, one of the limitations, as you have rightly pointed out, is extrapolation compared to the strength, which is interpolation. Mm -hmm. So what is the way forward for this project? Is it some kind of decline analysis that you can go to or what what is the way forward that you are looking for from this project that you have done? Okay, I would say two things. The first thing uh, for me to do from here on out was is to model a saturated oil reservoir and to see if we can use proxy models to model multi-phase flow. And to do that, just um, real quickly, what I'll have to add to the uh, the history match will be to history match the uh, re uh, relative permeability curve to match GOR. So I'd have to add the, um, I'd have to, and CMG allows you to do this. You can history match on the uh, relative gas permeability at conate liquid saturation, and then also an exponent that controls the shape of the relative uh, permeability curve of gas to liquid. And that would allow you to match multi-phase flow. And I'm working on that right now. And then the second thing to do would be conduct a look back study. So use this to try and forecast how production would have been in real life um, and, and get, uh, so uh, generate type wells of a, um, of a unconventional, uh, of an unconventional field such as the, uh, the Delaware Basin and the Permian and see if you can um, and, and get, you know, 18 months production data of existing wells that all have a similar completion design uh, and, and lateral length and match, use the proxy models to history match that, that uh, type well and then forecast that out and then compare that production forecast to how those current wells in real life are doing. So that way I can we can see how the proxy models perform to a real life yep, yep. instance. Thanks, Anthony. I'll let the other judges go ahead and ask questions. Um, any more questions for Anthony from the judges? Yes. Uh, hello, Anthony. I want to ask about the, your proximal model architecture. Actually, the structural barriers of the reservoir is, is that captured for your proxy models. For example, that if you have a very complex fault, um, like that. Thank you. Yes, that's a good question as well. Um, I did not include any uh, geomechanics or rock mechanics in the symmetry model, and the reason for that is is that that would be you know a, a very unique type of thing to certain wells that you were drilling, so or certain wells that you were drilling completing. So, and th this um, approach is more for at the uh, corporate level for things like budgeting and planning for the entire company. Now, if I was a completion engineer, and, you know, working in operations and I had a specific well, that's when you'd want to use a much more detailed um, fracture model and reservoir uh, simulation model to be able to model that. So that is a limitation of the proxy model and that it cannot do that. But again, that's not the purpose. The purpose of this is more for overall corporate planning for a company and um, coming up with a development plan for the entire company. Okay, thank you very much, Anthony. Um, so we can take any more questions. So um, <clears throat> thank you very much for your presentation. We now move on to our penultimate presentation. Um, and it's Ben, winner of the South Western North America Paper Contest. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you, Anthony. I will say it was that big one. I was I won that. I won the big one. Hello everyone, my name is Ben Zong, and today I'll be talking about plunger lift wall optimization through data analytics and machine learning. Just a little bit about myself, 
I'm currently a senior studying petroleum engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm graduating this winter and I'll be starting to working full time as a data scientist in 2022. Here, I'll just go over what I'll be talking about for the next 15, 20 minutes. I'll give some background knowledge on what plungers are and how plungers work. I'll showcase the data I worked with, the machine learning program I built, some data visualization I did with the software Spotfire, as well as some field testing results and the impact of my project. Starting with uh, some background knowledge on plungers. Now imagine that this water bottle is an oil well. When the oil well is first drilled, there's enough pressure to push all the fluids out. Imagine if I squeeze this bottle hard enough, the water will come out. However, as the well ages, the pressure decreases and there's not gonna be enough energy to bring all the fluids out. Therefore, people insert a long piece of pipe called a tubing. Here, I'll demonstrate it as a straw. After you install this piece of tubing, people usually inject gas into the annulus, which is the space outside the tubing, but within the wellboard. So if I blow into the annulus like this, the pressure is gonna force the water to come out through the tubing, just like how blowing into it costs energy. In real life, such operations will cost a lot of money. Plus on top of that, in real life, when the tubing is 8,000 or 9,000 or even 10,000 feet long, Gas would not be an ideal carrier of fluids and it will be very inefficient. To deal with this challenge, people usually insert a piston-like metal cylinder called a plunger into the tubing, analogous to the straw. A plunger has almost the exact same diameter as the tubing, so it will barely fit inside the tubing. Yet, it's still able to move up and down like a piston. Most of those plungers contains a one-way valve that's des designed to open at the wellhead and then trigger to close when it reaches the end of the tubing. So this valve enables the plunger to fall through upward flowing liquid and rise with the seal to prevent the fluids on top from falling back down. After you put the plunger in, whenever you shut in the well, the plunger will fall because of gravity. And when, you, when the plunger reaches the bottom of the tubing, the well will open up the well back up again. And because of the pressure, uh, the plunger will act like a piston to push all the fluids in the tubing out. And the well is open and shut repetitively throughout the day. And of course, this process is all automated. Plunger will make many trips from six to eight to even 30 and 40 trips per day, for which the trip time, the settings, the amount of gas injected are all recorded as our data. Just in summary, the plungers are there to keep the fluid from falling back down tubing when you're just injecting gas. And with the plunger, we can upload a lot more fluid than just with gas. Plungers come in many different weights, shapes, and sizes, and they have different ability to fall through flow. Based on their mechanism and their fall speed, they can be grouped into five major categories from type one to type five. Type one plunger uses a ball as its one-way valve, and it falls through the flow very fast. Type two plunger uses a rod that's embedded on the lower half as its one-way valve. It falls quite as fast, but not as fast as type one. Type three plungers, one-way valve mechanism is a rod that goes through the entire plunger, and it doesn't fall as fast as the previous two. Type four and type five don't have and one-way valve. And their difference is that type four has a small hole in the center. They fall very slowly with type four being slightly faster than type five. So for example, type one plunger has a large hollow hole in the center compared to type four's tiny hole in the center. So type one will fall a lot faster than type four and it will make a lot more trips per day. And therefore uses a lot more gas injection. On the right, it's a type five plunger. It is pretty much just a solid metal cylinder without the one-way valve. So it will take a long time for it to reach the bottom and therefore uses a lot less gas injection. Wells should change their plungers from a type one 
to a type five throughout their lifetime for maximum efficiency. However, right now, operators are only putting them in based on their experience and trials and errors, which is not very efficient. So I was given the job to use the data to figure out what type of plunger is best for what kind of well. Now, just like plungers, every well is different. Some well make a lot more oil, some wells make a lot more gas, and some wells are more water saturated. After brainstorming for some time, I thought about the limitation of data collection, measurement errors, etc., and decided to use the daily average data to do this project. There were about 1.5 million rows of raw data from 900 some wells over a span of 400 plus days of production that I had to work with. But I was able to use SQL to get a data I wanted into data tables from two different databases. For the first data table, it contains the daily average pressure data, forecast production given by the reservoir engineering team, as well as actual production. Data table two contains different kinds of data related to plungers, like how long it took for this plunger to make one trip, how many trips it made in a day, how much time you allow the plunger to fall to the bottom, how much time you give the plunger for it to rise to the top and how much gas you're injecting. Last but not least, we have the plunger maintenance data. That shows us when a plunger was put in or when an old plunger was taken out or whenever an operator checks on a plunger. Therefore, there was quite a bit of brain work to figure out what kind of plunger was running in what well over what period of time. Like I said, there was a lot of prep work that needed to transform the data. From the plunger maintenance data, we had to determine what kind of plunger was running in what date range for all 900 wells. And after that, we had to join the two different data tables together, pivot some rows to get the final data table. And then I added some calculated columns like gas leak ratio, water cut, and clean up some bad data, and so on. It was very tedious, but it was crucial for what I'll be doing later. After all the prep work, I was able to make these two things. I created an interactive spot fire guide that focused on this factor called gas utilization factor, GUF, which is gas injection divided by liquid production. I also coded a machine learning program with Python and scikit-learn that focused on the gross, the gross revenue of a well when running with a certain type of plunger. So the higher the revenue, the better that plunger is. Starting with the machine learning program, I built five machine learning models, one for each of the five types of plunger using this algorithm called random forest. Each model predicts the gross revenue of a well running with the corresponding type of plunger. Given a, well, given a well's info like pressure, gas wall ratio, water cut, a total of 14 variables, the model will predict the gross revenue per day when running with its style of plunger. The program contains one random forest regressor model for each of the five types of plungers. And the only difference between those models is in their data set. In other words, each model was only trained and tested on their specific plunger's data. For example, type one plungers model will only use data generated by type one plunger in the field. And additionally, uh, all the data are from the same basin, the Eagleford basin. Now let's take a look at the program. It, 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 this program may sound very complicated, but it's actually very easy to use. Any operator in the field only need to type in the well's name to use it. And this works by pulling the well's past seven days average data from a database and putting it through the program. Each of the five models takes in the same current data from the well that we want to make a prediction on. And each model will then make a prediction at the same time. The model that predicts the highest revenue is picked and that type of plunger will be considered the most optimal for this well. The correlation score obtained through the validation data set range from 0.8 to 0.9 for each model. So I would say that those models are fairly accurate. Here's what each model contains. The computer generates many decision trees like this based on its observation of our historical plunger data. This is just an extremely simplified version though. The actual trees in this model are actually way too big and complex to be shown on this PowerPoint. Anyways, the computer generates many trees like this using statistical methods and randomness, using 
the historical plunger data and based on criteria like forecast oil production, water cut, gas liquid ratio, and so on, models will predict how much money a well can make when running with its corresponding style of plunger. Next, I'm gonna show you the Spotfire, the Spotfire guide. So while I was coding the machine learning program, I made some data visualization with Spotfire. And for this guide, I try to focus on efficiency to look at things from a different perspective. There are many, dash uh, there are many dashboards in this guide, but I'll just focus on the following two. It's an interactive guide that anybody, where you, whether you're an engineer or operator, can navigate through and look at past performances of different kinds of plungers. This is an example. Uh, it's a cumulative probability graph that shows the efficiency distribution of five different kinds of plungers. And you can select certain parameters to look at specific types of wells. For example, if you want to look at wells that make less than 50 bar barrels, you just, you just want to look at low producers, you can simply do that by dragging a slider. It's an awesome tool that the operators can use to improve their wells by optimizing their plunger style choice. There are many graphs in this guide, but I'll try to focus on the following two. You simply uh, select the gas liquid ratio bucket and look at the corresponding production bin. In this case, whichever plunger has the lowest gas utilization factor will be considered the most efficient among wells within this kind of condition. Next, I'm gonna talk about some field testing results. Before I start talking about the, the uh, results, I would like to talk about the limitations of the data. Aside from the features I factored in, there are a lot of other considerations that need to be taken into account when selecting a plunger. For example, you don't want to run certain types of plunger in a well with sand or paraffin problems because they might get stuck regardless of how efficient they might be. Because if they get stuck, it will cost a lot of money to fish them out. You might not want to run certain types of plunger when you don't have enough injection supply, even though you can theoretically produce a lot more. You might not need to run an expensive plunger on low producers by efficiency gain because the return on investment will be very low. These are the features that are impossible, unnecessary, or just difficult to quantify. And data can only act as a guide to advise you what might be the best to do based on history. One cannot, cannot just press a button, even though it's machine learning or whatsoever, and expect to know the right answer. And that's my takeaway from this project. My project aims better injection efficiency through plunger style selection. And there are three scenarios in terms of better efficiency. The field tests I did mostly fell into the third. Overall, it's pretty conservative to say that we can increase efficiency by 5% overall through better plunger style selection. And that translates to saving about 10 cents per barrel of liquid, including water produced. Applying that to all plunger wells, that will be about $4,000 a day worth of savings. Over a span of a year, that will be way over a million dollar worth of savings. And that doesn't even include the revenue generated by the additional oil and gas production. It will be really hard to quantify how much more oil and gas my project can increase because every well will react differently to the change in their plunger style. Not to mention the tools I made can also save operators time and help them learn about how different plungers run at different wells. And those are the tools that help educate operators on plungers and help them make their own decisions. Lastly, I will just like to give an executive summary of what I've done. I was given the task to figure out what kind of plunger was best for what kind of wells. And I used SQL to gather the data I wanted and turn the data into something that's useful, like the machine learning program, the Spotfire guide. The tools I made performed well in the field and achieved the theoretical savings of more than a million dollars a year in terms of gas injection. And in the future, here are some of the steps that can be taken. We can gather higher quality data for all kinds of plungers in order to maximize the efficiency gain. And we can potentially apply those tools into other basins that use plungers as well. Thank you, that's all I have. Thank you very much <clears throat> for that. Let me, I'll now make you a co-host. So, dear judges, you can now um, 
kindly unmute yourselves and um, turn on your cameras if you have a question for Ben. Judges, over to you. Oh, the presentation was so good. We have no questions for him. Uh, yeah, exactly. It was like it was like that. Um, it was very clear, and um, as you can see, it was like very specific to um, a certain uh, a certain issue or aspect. And it's like you focus on one thing, and you almost covered all aspects regarding that thing. So thank you for that. So like like the outcome of your of your work that now you presented. Uh, a presenting a program or a method that it has a user-friendly interface, correct? That at the field, anyone can operate it to make quick decisions. Like, you know, these things, sometimes it need, the decision need to be taken immediately. So the question about time, like usually to collect this data because these data are collected on a daily basis from different wells, right? So the, the time like to come up with a decision, usually how long? Oh, well, the model itself is very quick. I would say the prediction itself would probably take from five to 10 seconds. So it's uh, rather pretty efficient, I would say. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the great work. Thank All you. Appreciate best. it. Hello, Ben. Uh, I may ask about your efficiencies of gas injection. Well, to um, maintain the production uh, as stated in your presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, what uh, the typical gas injection rate that already been injected with wells and the optimization that you already made by the machine learning in which that you present in your, in your presentation. Gas injection rate optimization in what uh, and also it maintains production in what I'm active. Can you please explain? Uh, so uh, let me repeat your question. Uh, were you asking about the range of gas injection? Uh, yes. That's you mean that you, yeah. You mean that the, the objective is to reduce the gas injection that's mm -hmm. maintain the production, right? So yeah. uh, based on your, the, the history of the wells that already you observe, uh, mm -hmm. the gas injection reduction that you already uh, Optimize based on your plunger leaf uh, system is uh, what uh, what percentage? Gotcha. So all the wells I worked on were making less than hundred barrels per per day, and that's the type of well you want to use a plunger on. And the gas injection typically range it from um, two hundred mfcf to well uh, four hundred and goes upward to like six hundred mfcf per day. And it really depends on uh, like how, how the well reacts to the change. And sometimes it can save up to, uh, let's say, uh, 100 to 200 MSCF. And uh, other times it will be like 50 MSCF. So it, like, it varies really. And as for the production increase, uh, I would say typically uh, the production increase could be from like uh, probably around five barrels per day on average uh, in terms of oil production. Uh, and, uh, but sometimes you, you get this influx of production like the first day that you make the change and that could go up to like 10, 20 barrels per day. Uh, I would say that's pretty, pretty decent consider the well is making less than hundred barrels a day and that's a decent percent percentage increase. Okay, thank you. Any more questions for Ben before I uh, let him go? Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you.
Thank you very much for your presentation. Now to our final presentation of the day, Jose Daniel Valero Mandon, winner of the Latin America and Caribbean Paper Contest. Hello, my name is Jose Daniel Vigermandon and I'm here on behalf of the National University of Colombia Sede Medellin. So today we're going to be talking about type curves based on the Robin type boundary condition for pressure transient testing in horizontal wells for unconventional formations. I hope this presentation meets your expectations. So the agenda that we are going to be following today, it's going to be a brief introduction key concepts to keep in mind, the physical model, the mathematical model, the methodology we follow in order to create the type curves, the results we obtained, some conclusions and some knowledge for the people that helped me out. For me, there are three main ideas in this paper. First of all, non-conventional reservoirs. PMRS defines non-conventional as large accumulations of fluid that is barely affected by hydrodynamics, meaning that the fluid has no experimented migration itself, leading to no permeability in the reservoir. The fractal theory. Wolfram defines a fractal as an object that displays self-similarity. That means that when you see the object in different scales, you always see similar structures. Additionally, the Robin type boundary conditions that it's defined as a linear combination of a Dirichlet condition with a Newman condition. But why is this so important as an approach to non-conventional? Here are some advantages of the fractal theory and the Robin type boundary conditions. For the fractal theory, it increases the understanding of the fractures, reduces the uncertainty in the model, and also have been proved as a great option in naturally fractured reservoirs. For the Robin type boundary conditions, it will allow us to understand better the way the pressure answer reacts to changes in the media, and also increase the flexibility on the model by joining different type of boundary conditions. There are some key concepts useful for a better understanding of this work. For the fractal theory, there are three main variables. The fractal dimension that refers to how detailed it is the pattern when you measure it in a defined scale. The interconnectivity index, also known as the anomalous flux index, and is a statistical measure on how many of the fractures give fluid to another fracture. Likely, in the double porosity model, not all the fractures go to the wellbore. And the storability radio, that is the relationship between the fractures and the matrix on the reservoir. For understanding better the Robin type boundary condition, we're going to define the stimulated sum as a volume of the reservoir affected by a mechanic process in the well as an hydraulic fracture that increased the permeability in the sun. And the transmissibility, that it's the radio flux for a fluid of a certain density and viscosity under a porous media. And the transmissibility radio, that it's going to be the radio between the transmissibility between the sun is stimulated and the sun with the original transmissibility. Having the previous concepts in mind, let's get into matter. Here's the physical model that we are going to work. In the lateral view, we can see that we have a horizontal well that is surrounded by a cylindrical stimulated sun with T1 that's going to be higher than transmissibility of the original region T2. Okay? And in the top view, we can see that this cylinder and for the well, the only way that has the reservoir to provide the fluid to the well, it's going to be the fractures that has the reservoir. And not all the fractures are connecting to the well, just there are a few. But in this case, we can see that some of the fractures are connected each one to the other one. In order to model this reservoir, we decided to start from the work of Gu et al. in 2016 by using the model's fractally fractional differential equation. Proceeding with the steps that lean well testing developed for transient well testing, we go to the general solution in the Laplace space for dimensionless pressure, as we can see here in equation one. Then starts the innovation in this work. 
So we introduce the Robin type boundary condition with a term C, that is the transmissibility radio, okay? So when the transmissibility radio is close to zero, means that T1 and T2 are similar, leading to a continuous in the space. So when the system reaches the limit of the simulated zone, it's going to be following the same pattern of flux, leading to a constant pressure outer boundary. In the other case, we can have a closed out boundary. And then we introduce the common internal conditions of astrogravity and skin factor conditions. So applying the Robin type boundary conditions and internal conditions, we reach to the dimensionless wellbore pressure in the Laplace space, okay? The only thing that we need to do is to solve the function f, the function g that we saw in the last slide, and then proceed to evaluate them in the vessel functions. And that's going to be all in order to solve this equation. But then we're going to show up how is the process in order to model the dimensionless pressure in the world but in the space of the dimensionless variables, not in the Laplace. So, in order to get the solution in the dimensionless variables, we're going to use the stiffest algorithm. The stiffest algorithm is a numerical inversion that requires a variable time in the space that we want to reach and the solution in the space of Laplace. So, what we do is to evaluate this solution in this time with a certain algorithm that proposed this author in order to reach the dimensionless variables space. So, after reaching the dimensionless variables of space, we proceed to evaluate all the variables individually. We are going to only focus on the Robin type boundary condition and the fractal variables. So, we're going to only focus on the transmissibility radio, the fractal dimension, the interconnectivity radio, and the storivity radio. All these, known as the well testing variables, were used to confirm the consistency of the model with similar studies conducted by Lou in 2009 and Flamenco Lopez in 2001. In order to have a better understanding on the process that we have here on the results, we need to know that all the curves are plotted in a logarithmic plot, okay? And we have two types of curves, the dimensionless pressure, that is this curve up here, and the derivative curve, okay? By knowing the derivative curve, we can see that we have two types of zones here on the plots, okay? The wellbore storage, the transition to the radial flux, and the radial flux period, okay? And additionally, we can check that mainly the outcome of the boundary conditions is here in the radial flux zone, okay? Also, we can see that the Robin type boundary condition allows us to recreate each one of the three main conditions. Okay, also prove that the infinite reservoir is only a specific case for the constant pressure boundary condition. Additionally, it means that the Robin type boundary condition is a reduction in computational time for the developing of these new models. And that's one of the main outcomes of this work. After seeing the phenomena that happened in the last curve, we decided to play a little with the transmissibility radio and see what happens when the transmissibility radio is a non-integral number between 0 and 1. The funny fact is that each one of the curves that are not the curve for the transmissibility radio equal to 1 tend to a constant pressure boundary condition. That means that the difference in transmissibility is not high enough in order to proceed to represent a increase in the pressure requirements for producing a certain quantity of flux in the reservoir. Additionally, that means that if we have a small difference in transmissibility between T1 and T2, we can only use the close-up boundary condition and the constant pressure boundary condition in order to represent all the possible outcomes in this case. So after what we saw in the last slide, we have a really important question. Are all the curves tending to a constant pressure boundary condition? We decided to prove it wrong. So we decided to approach logarithmically to one in the transmissibility radio. And what we saw is when the difference in transmissibility are greater than 100 times, 
the system starts to show an increase in the requirements of pressure, okay, in order to produce the same amount of freight. This is really important because if we have in head that the steam zone has fractures, probably for each fracture you're going to have a transmissibility rounding up the five or six Darcy's and you're going to have a reservoir with probably the permeability of 100 or maybe thousands of nano Darcy's. You see that it's going to be from five to six orders of magnitude of difference. OK, we're not talking about 100 times. We are even talking about 10,000 times, maybe one million times greater difference between the transmissibility of the fracture and the reservoir, leading to the conclusion that probably all the non-conventionals in the world are between this range of curves. We are not applying close boundary. We're not applying constant pressure. We have a curve that moves between these path. And it's important because if we could find out which is the transmissibility radio, we could identify how good was our stimulation process in the reservoir. And it's really important because if we have a higher difference in permeability, that means that our process went really good. If we have less, that means that probably our process was not as effective as we expected. So it's the first time in order to create a new outcome of these supercritical conditions over the robin type boundary conditions and it's the first time in latin america that we see these phenomena applied to non-conventionals and i risk myself to say this is the first time in the world that we see this increase in the pressure that it's not a close-up boundary that is not a constant pressure boundary but the system requires more energy to produce when it has higher differences between the transmissibility of each zone In terms of productivity, these are also a really important difference between using a robin type boundary condition or a general condition of a closed boundary or something. Because if we check on here, if we compare the closed boundary against the robin type boundary condition for 0 0.999, we can see that it could lead to an overestimation of around 6 hundred times the pressure that our reservoir is showing us okay and not to say like how much is gonna be the difference with the curves that we have here because it's gonna be graded it's gonna be around seven or six times that mean an error of 700 800 percent just by using robin type boundary conditions and that's really important Now we're going to proceed to analyze the fractal behavior with results that are equally interesting as the ones that we saw in the Robin type boundary conditions. So first of all, let's analyze the fractal dimension. As we can see, the fractal dimension increases the pressure requirements for producing the same rate. So as we decrease the fractal dimension, we increase the requirements in pressure. So if we check the images at this side, we can see that back here we have the fractal dimension of 2 and fractal dimension of 1.75 so we can see here that's probably the difference between the blue curve and the green curve and we can see that on dimensionless pressure it's going to be around 40 percent of increase in order to produce the same amount of fluid in order to understand these graphs i think that you should keep in mind these two images okay this is fractal dimension equal to this is fractal dimension 1.75 okay this is similar to what we will see in fractal dimension 1.8 okay in this new graph we decided to implement the methodology already used by Sao and Sang in order to create a graph that could be used for non-conventional reservoirs that has little to none differences in pressure when we are seeing the methodology so the main thing it's gonna be here what happens in the late times and what happens here in the early times so in the early times is a funny fact because we see that the fractal dimension equal 1.8 it's less expensive in terms of pressure than the fractal dimension equals 2 probably that's related with the phenomena of the well gravity because the fluid is not moving as fast so you have time in order to proceed with the expansion but in the late times as we expected okay we have less fractures so it's 
harder for the reservoir to move the fluid and that's the reason why the pressure requirement for late times increase by 40 percent and in fact the derivative curve confirms the theory that the wellbore storage is affected by the fractal dimension so we can compare on here the wellbore storage time that it's the time when the curves like leaves or separates from this straight line and we can see here that for the fractal dimension equals two you have a separation back here and for the dimension of fractal dimension of 1.8 we have a separation back here okay that means that if by any chance we're able to match up the reservoir curves with these curves we can highly identify how fractal is a reservoir because we only need to check on how much are the changes between the well water storage time taking into account that we already know those variables from the analysis that we have already conducted with the well testing variables developed by Lee. So this could be the first time we are able to identify the fractal dimension for a reservoir in an analysis for non-conventional reservoirs. Regarding the interconnectivity index, there are two main ideas in order to have a better understanding on what happens when we have a problem with an interconnectivity index. First of all, we have here the difference between this curve and this curve. Okay, so we can see that in terms of productivity, we want to have the less connected diffractors between the fractures that we can, because it's gonna be like a thief for the energy and the fluid that we are gonna be giving to the wellbore. Okay, additionally, we can see that this phenomena only affects the transition and the radial flux zone. It's no affectation over the wellbore storage. That means that this phenomena is only seen after the transition zone, different from the phenomena that we saw uh, on the fractal behavior that it starts in the wellbore storage. So that's a good point in order to differentiate which phenomena affects which of the reservoir status okay so if we see that there are changes in the world where rush probably it's gonna be fractal dimension if we see that the changes are only seen after the transition zone it's probably because of the interconnectivity behavior now we see here the effect of the astrogravity radio okay so what we see on here is how much is the volume of the fracture regarding the volume the total volume of the reservoir okay so we can see on here that this phenomena only affects the transition zone okay and all the curves tend to have the same point or a point where it reaches like this curve and we can see this phenomena here there is a kind of a masking of the valley that we would see if we have a normal curve okay so this phenomena only affects the transition zone additionally, and it's really important. And we can combine the effects of both the interconnectivity index and the storivity radio to see what happens. So the effect of combining the storivity radio and the interconnectivity index over the derivative curve, we can see on here that the most important here is the first two curves. We can see that the effect of the interconnectivity index is less important nor less important is masked up because of the volume of the fractures in the reservoir so it's an important variable the volume of the fractures regarding the matrix because it could cover up all the phenomena that we will see in a fractal behavior and it's really common to have a huge volume of fractures in a non-conventional because it's the main possibility to move that fluid it's the main possibility to have fluid because the definition of porosity itself doesn't belong to a fractal reservoir or even a non-conventional reservoir so that's the main idea why it's important to have a better understanding on how much is the volume of the fractures
condition. Regarding the fractal behavior, we can see that the introduction of the modification of the saw and sank and crafts introduced by the author produces an easier way to identify the effect of the fractal dimension over the dimensional pressure and the derivative curve. Additionally, reducing the fractal dimension will increase the effect of the fluid expansion or the well bore storage in early times, okay? But also will mean in late times an increase of the pressure needed to produce the fluid. Additionally, we can see that the increase of the storivity radio could mask up similar processes, okay? So it's important to have a good determination and how much is going to be my fracture volume in order to have in mind or keep in mind that probably that volume could mask up all the processes okay so i would like to say thank you thank you to the national university of colombia sedimental union for the support given to carry out this work i would like to say a special thank you to the professor edwin lopez of the same university for your support all your ideas were the light for me in this path. Without you, this work will still be in the confusing and sometimes beautiful world of the ideas. Your support was crucial to reach these results. And especially to my family, you have been the strength through all this process. This work is more yours than mine. You helped me to deal with the frustration, encouraged me not to quit. Well, today I'm here thanks to your support. Thank you all for listening and I'm open to your questions. Hi, Jose. Uh, thank you oh. for the excellent presentation. I'm truly sorry for what happened with the video. Okay, well, uh, I thought that was okay. I think there was maybe a, a non the complete version not the complete version of what happened with the presentation. Uh, half just like back here, it's just like back here. So if you want me to, I can show you a little because this one is only like a preview of the results. The most important part of the development was already like in the slides, in the next slide. And if you want me to, I can go really fast on the, the greatest advantages of this work. And that's it. And truly very, uh, I didn't expect this to happen, and I'm really, really, really sad because of that. But Sherlyn, go ahead with your question. Uh, thank you, Jose. Uh, this is Kontal. Thank you for the great presentation and the excellent amount of work that you have put in. It clearly shows. I don't have any questions, but just wanted to commend you the uh, great work that you have done in the research paper. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much because uh, I, I don't know, I usually feel like, uh, uh, well, these kind of things usually happen. So, well, I'm open to your questions. And if you have already like uh, seen the presentation and if you have any further questions, please go ahead. Yeah, Jose, I wouldn't worry too much about the one minute um, lag. Um, the, the judges do have your presentations with them. So they can always refer to um, that timestamp. Okay, you know. for sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. No problem. Um, do we have any more questions for Jose? Judges? Okay, I, I think um, I know um, if we don't have any more questions for Jose, um, let me just then go ahead to, so um, that now brings us to the end of um, the presentations for today's contest. A big thank you to all of you involved. We'll be signing off now, during which time the judges will review and rank their scores. I would like all the judges, I would ask all the judges to stay online for a few more minutes and we'll then move to the breakout room. Before we go, don't forget to be announcing the winners of the of all the SPC, SPC divisions doing the um, Students Award Ceremony on Thursday. If you haven't registered to attend this yet, you can find all the details at the ATC webpage, which you can find at atc.org, along with other with more information on all our events. Thank you again. We hope you have a great ATC.
Okay, thank you so much. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I think at this point, um, we have two options. I could create a, a breakout room for the judges to, to move into, or I could ask all the presenters to kindly um, leave the chat room. Hey, Ola, can you give me like 10 minutes just to finish fill out my scores for the last three presentations? Yeah, that's fine. So you know what? They're all living. So um, let's just stay in here. So okay. uh, you can turn your cameras off while you finalize your numbers, then we'll come back. Um, Ola, my Excel sheet, I worked on the online Excel sheet uh, directly. So if you can just have a look and see if everything is in place. It looks okay to me. Um, could you, could I ask that, because um, um, I think we're, could I ask that you send me an email with your scores? Okay. I'll, I'll put my email address in the chat box now. So that you right, can all because, know. Yeah? Because, the first page, because the first page of the sheet explicitly says not to download it and says we should be working on the online version. That's why. Yes. Yeah. That's fine. No worries. I'll send you the email. Yeah. Are you SPC email? No, I'll, I'll put my email address in the uh, in the chat box. So o it's o, yeah, o Davis at sp .org. Uh, Just a question. Uh, I think we are still live. Can we still discuss here? No. So hold on while I stop. Yeah. The the recording. Yeah, I think we're live. still live. Yes. Yeah. And.